So, Zafar, uh, thanks for being so patient with us today. Not at all. The thing is, there's so many people that are waiting to hear from you. There's been so much going on in the world. I know people are expecting your voice and your perspective on this because uh, last week I was scheduled to interview you about the Koran burning issue in Afghanistan. And I wait one week. We had to delay it a bit, and I come back, and there's been another disaster, this massacre in Afghanistan. So things are happening at an accelerated tempo, I think. And we talked about turning points a few months back in reference to Pakistan, maybe not so much Afghanistan, but maybe here a turning point has been reached. What do you think? Yes, of course. Um, And and you point to uh, these uh, rapid uh, incidents that are occurring, uh, the latest one, uh, this massacre that occurred uh, last Sunday uh, in Panjue district of Kandahar province, in which 16 people were slaughtered in their homes, um, out of which um, nine were children, and there were three women. And um, this was a, a deliberate, systematic attack when, uh, according to the information that has been released, uh, a, a U.S. Um, Army sergeant left his base and uh, went on a rampage, breaking down doors and shooting people, uh, and not only shooting and killing them, but uh, also then uh, setting fire to at least six of the bodies uh, of people that he had killed, of whom I believe four or five were again uh, children, the youngest being a two-year-old girl. Uh, Interestingly, Uh, The U.S. government or military have not released the name of this particular soldier. Uh, They keep on referring to him as a lone gunman and that he had had problems before, uh, etc., etc. But there is a systematic pattern. I mean, if we we review what uh, the U.S. Army has been doing in Afghanistan, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the Quran desecration episode last month. Um, when copies of the Quran were burnt. There were massive protests throughout Afghanistan. There were at least 30 Afghans killed in these demonstrations uh, by uh, American as well as Afghan uh, security forces. And prior to that, we had that horrible video in which um, U.S. Marines are urinating on four dead uh, Afghans, that they had shot. And these are the kinds of episodes that really drive uh, the people of Afghanistan uh, to absolute rage because, um, number one, among Muslims, uh, there is, uh, first of all, deep respect for the Quran. Uh, Muslims revere it. It is considered to be a divine text, and it must be treated with the greatest of respect. Muslims are not even allowed to touch it unless they are in a state of purity. This is what the Quran demands. Uh, So you can imagine as to how much respect Muslims accord to it, and when when it is uh, set on fire and dumped on the garbage dump, obviously it inflames uh, Muslim passions. But we're supposed to know about this, not only American citizens, but of course especially the United States and NATO militaries that are present in Afghanistan. I heard about sensitivity training. Every time one of these incidents happens, they reassure us that they're aware of the issue, there's training being offered about the culture of Afghanistan and the values in the country and how United States soldiers, Canadian soldiers, can be more respectful to those values. So uh, how do we keep ending up in these situations? Well, that's precisely the point. Uh, You know, uh, after uh, those uh, Quran burning uh, incidents, uh, the the U.S. General John Allen, he announced that he was going to uh, put his uh, troops through sensitivity training. Now, one would think uh, that the Americans, having been there for more than 10 years, uh, that they would have had some sensitivity training prior to that. But, I mean, you know, they... The Americans say these things, but uh, they don't do anything about it simply because uh, we have the evidence that they are completely dismissive of the feelings of the people of Afghanistan. For instance, even Hamid Karzai, the nominal president of Afghanistan, has repeatedly called for uh, an end to the night raids that are carried out. That really, really upset the Afghans tremendously because... The Afghan culture, the way it is, and indeed this is with with, uh, all Muslims, that they 
uh, have certain areas that are considered to be no-go areas for strangers. One is people's home, inside their home, particularly where they have women and so on. And here are American soldiers that barge into their homes in the middle of the night. They break down doors, and then they have these women and girls and all uh, other people that those soldiers are not supposed to be there, and yet they, they keep on uh, terrorizing these people, often killing them, or dragging men right in front of you know the the uh, in front of the women that that witness all of these things. This is deeply uh, offensive to the Afghan people. Uh, that has not stopped, despite repeated requests by uh, the Afghan government and the Afghans themselves. Then the desecration of the Quran again is not an isolated incident. This had happened in in Guantanamo Bay. There were massive demonstrations throughout the world. This happened in, in when, the, when the story leaked out in 2005. This has happened in Iraq, and now we see that the same thing is happening in Afghanistan. So you see this aspect of sensitivity training they talk about, but there are no, uh, you know, no training imparted to these people. Nothing is done. Uh, in fact, there is an attitude of arrogance that, that uh, pervades the U.S. military and the U.S. administration, that they can do anything they want, they can do no wrong, and even if they do tough luck to other people, they have to put up with it. Well, now, there has to be a, a price to pay for that. You know, you'd think that uh, the soldiers, whether enlisted personnel or officers, would know better because a lot of soldiers in the United States comes from regions where I would say the Bible is very important, for example. And no one in, in some of these areas, or religious people, Christians and otherwise, in the United States would dispose of dozens of Bibles by burning them, I don't think. Exactly. You see, this is, this is the, the, the uh, it's, it actually goes to the heart of the matter that it's the attitude of arrogance, this, this American hubris that they can do no wrong, that whatever they do, people have to put up with it. And they have this disdain and contempt for other people. Uh, regrettably, we saw this here in Canada as well. I mean, you know, the former uh, Canadian uh, chief of defense staff, he had referred to the Taliban as scumbags and he was going to go and kill them and uh, obliterate them. And yet, you know, after spending $18 billion and about 160 Canadians, uh, Canadian lives uh, sacrificed, uh, Afghanistan is no better today than it was 10 years ago. In fact, much worse. And, and you know, I can tell you, uh, uh, Leon Panetta, the, the U.S. Defense Secretary, when he arrived in Afghanistan today on, on an uh, unannounced visit uh, at a military base, there was a an attempt on his life because somebody... Uh, drove a truck uh, close to where his plane had landed, and, and, and that uh, vehicle caught fire. Of course, Panata survived, but you can see uh, these kinds of things will occur in Afghanistan increasingly because when people are offended, when people are insulted, they will fight back and they will head back in, in very, very unpredictable ways. Well, how many times now have we pulled advisors and trainers and officers and liaison personnel outside of Afghan ministries and Afghan buildings you know, into a safe, protected NATO area? Now, how many times are NATO soldiers retreating behind armored vehicles and you know, mine-protected vehicles and driving around under heaps and tons of armor now instead of that interaction with the population we're supposed to have? It's just, you have this two-sided policy where, on the one hand, they say, we're going to be there and give candy to children and build schools and help women. And on the other side, they're saying, you know, these people are savages and they're backward and they're medieval and they're a thousand years behind us and they're never going to develop. And, and you have these attitudes. I've read about Afghan comments about the NATO personnel where the Afghan workers that are helping at the bases are treated as second-class citizens. And meanwhile, the Americans, Western forces, they have religious services there, uh, mostly Christian services. We know that there are strong religious components in the military, uh, religious training. Uh, briefings uh, about Islam that are damaging to religions other than Christianity. That's part of a culture we've seen as far back as, as Haiti in, in the modern U.S. military, the way that non-Christian cultures are portrayed. So how, how would you feel if you're an Afghan worker or someone being trained as a soldier when the Americans don't seem to want to reach out beyond their own values? Absolutely. Uh, that, that is um, also evident in the manner in which uh, the Afghan soldiers and policemen that are being uh, trained by the Americans, uh, that they often uh, turn their guns uh, on their trainers. Uh, we have had many, many episodes of these kinds of incidents uh, because the Afghans feel humiliated, they feel insulted, they are treated like dirt, they are, they are uh, abused, and the kind of language that is used against them is something that they will not put up with. 
and, and I can tell you the Afghans are uh, very, very proud people. They may be poor, they sure are, but they are extremely proud people, and they will not put up with these insults, no matter what the price may be to them. I mean, they'd rather give their life rather than allow uh, themselves to be humiliated or insulted uh, in that manner. And, you know, one of the interesting things, something that we need to keep in mind, that this particular sergeant major was part of the group of soldiers uh, who had gone to that area, and their task was to win the hearts and minds of the Afghans. Uh, I mean, I think that's really rich and ironic that uh, the, the, these people are supposed to go and win their hearts and minds, and yet they are so uh, insulting in their behavior and attitude towards the Afghans that they would barge into their homes in the middle of the night and just shoot people as if they were animals, uh, or, or even worse than animals. Uh, and, and then even set their bodies on fire. I mean, this is absolutely outrageous, quite honestly. Yes, and it's a pattern we saw in Iraq, too, with, with some of the massacres and the burning of bodies and other atrocities. I mean, you have an ongoing military occupation. Well, arguably, it also becomes a, a cultural occupation in which people's values are being demeaned. That's going to sustain a resistance no, no matter what you do. But Americans are catching on to this. They're cluing on. It's not as if Americans are ignorant to what's been happening or the warnings that have been given, including by figures such as yourself. You've warned us about these possibilities. and the attitudes that were developing in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so more than uh, 55, 60 percent of Americans think that Afghanistan has been a waste, that uh, there should not have been an occupation, that uh, troops should leave immediately, even if the so-called objectives are not complete. So there has been a change, a sea change in American politics where even Democrats and Republicans are, are both calling for uh, an earlier exit than Obama's 2014 goal. Exactly. I mean, this, this is actually, uh, you know, something quite remarkable because uh, until uh, now um, the, the corporate media was simply parroting the official line, oh, we are making progress, we are achieving our objectives, we are achieving our goals, etc. Uh, but the American people are no longer fooled by this kind of nonsense. I mean, they know that uh, terrible things are happening in Afghanistan. And as you rightly pointed out, 55 to 60 percent of the American people have now reached the conclusion that uh, this this war is tot a total failure. Uh, it has drained uh, the American economy and its resources. Uh, the the, bl uh, the the brunt of this this cost has been borne by the American people, both uh, uh, you know the the war in Afghanistan as well as in Iraq, and therefore they wish to have nothing more to do with it. And I mean the American people do not wish to go and and you know fight and insult other people. It's it's the uh, the elite in America. You know what we witnessed in the in the um, Occupy Wall Street movement. The 99 percent of the population of the U.S. Uh, are not the people that want to go and, and be killing other people. It's the 1% elite that are addicted to war because they see war as a way to keep people's minds preoccupied with other things. And, of course, this, this uh, war industry or this culture of war is beneficial to them. Yeah, so, and, and this 99% is increasingly finding out uh, what happens when you have all these colonial wars. I think that there were those protests by Afghans after the Koran burning, and U.S. officials, NATO officials said that they, they, they had exhibited or exercised restraint by not immediately shooting or killing the protesters. So that's the, the default position now is to aim your, your gun at protesters, and that, that's going to be in the U.S. and Afghanistan. A lot of people are finding that out. Exactly. I mean, also, like, you know, it's interesting that after every um, episode uh, that... Um, insults the Afghans that, that leads to, that, that causes Afghan deaths or these kinds of desecrations, uh, the Americans' uh, default position is that they are going to launch uh, an inquiry. And, you know, I mean, there have been literally dozens of such announcements made by uh, American officials at the highest level, including Obama, including, you know, the, the, the U.S. Defense Secretary and other officials, generals, etc. Yet, what do we find? I mean, absolutely nothing has come out of these. Like, you know, we can go as far back as April of 2002 when an Afghan taxi driver uh, who, was just, uh, who just happened to pass by where uh, a little while earlier a bomb had exploded, uh, the American soldiers just grabbed him, and there was one particular uh, sadistic uh, American 
a soldier by the name of Joshua Klaus, who had this poor Afghan taxi driver by the name of Dilawar Khan uh, strung up uh, by chains uh, from his wrists, and and he beat this poor guy to death over a period of three days. I mean, he would um, take these iron bars and and smash his legs, and when the poor guy was screaming, uh, you know, these American soldiers would laugh at him. And what was the punishment for Joshua Klaus for murdering in cold blood, according to the autopsy report of the U.S. Army itself, that, that this poor man had been beaten to death by Joshua Klaus, and, and this Afghan was a completely innocent guy who just happened to, as, as, as a result of bad luck, happened to be driving by near over there. He was beaten to death, and Joshua Klaus got a total of five months imprisonment. Yes, but you can't sweep this under the rug forever. You mentioned that there's always an inquiry. I think the pattern is first they deny it. They say nothing happened or they don't have any confirmation of it. And then after other media and the Afghan government or the Pakistan government or the Iraq government confirms an atrocity, then they say, well, we're investigating it. It's a long, drawn-out process, and, and it's, a, it's almost like a, a ballet. Uh, it's very choreographed. But it's gotten back to here now. The intensity, the immensity of these claims and these, these incidents, which have undermined support for the war. But despite all that, you mentioned there's, there's a 1%, there's people that stand to benefit a lot from foreign conflicts, and now some of these people are trying to get us into Syria. And, you know, you have uh, John McCain saying that we need to bomb Syria. He's uh, been very loud about that, as he was in the case of Libya and previous wars. Hillary Clinton is calling for regime change. There's a lot of um, familiar talk going on about Syria, and we've been able to cover that on this program in the past. But there's there's one thing that very much interests me, and I, I watch a lot of alternative televised media. I keep track of Al Jazeera's commentary and, and things like that. And when we talk about Syria... We're going beyond the United States and Canada. It still seems that there's a certain point of view that U.S. allies like Qatar or Saudi Arabia are putting forward. You know, the Gulf states, these monarchies especially, are framing things in such a way that all that has to be done is support any armed element that can overthrow the Assad government, and then everything will be fine. You know, the, the only actors involved are perhaps Muslims in general versus the Assad regime. Do you think those are the only two sides here? No, not at all. In fact, um, the manner in which the whole of the Syrian uh, issue is being framed is outrageous, quite honestly. There are weapons being smuggled uh, into Syria from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, from the United Arab Emirates, from Turkey, from Jordan. Uh, the Israelis are over there. Um, Saudi Qatari troops are over there. Uh, so are French, in fact. Uh, a number of French uh, commandos were captured by the Syrian army. And uh, when weapons are smuggled into a country uh, to attack people and uh, attack government installations, naturally it is the responsibility of the government to react and to protect itself. Uh, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, they, they, um, Assad regime has been trying to... Uh, reach out to these people so that there could be a political dialogue inside the country. On the other hand, um, any time any proposal is made by the Syrian uh, regime, the Americans are the first to dismiss it. Like, you know, uh, on February 26th, there was a referendum held in Syria that uh, there should be uh, multi-party elections. And uh, the Americans, as well as their allies, immediately dismissed that. They said, no, no, we don't want any referendum on this issue. Uh, Assad should re resign immediately. Uh, yesterday, the, the Syrian government announced that they are going to hold elections in May. And Hillary Clinton was the first one to say, uh, uh, elections are impractical. What we want um, uh, Bashar al-Assad to do is to uh, tell us when he's going to resign so that there could be peace and stability in Syria. Now, you know, no government, no matter whether it's legitimate or illegitimate, is going to resign just because the Americans say so. I mean, you know, it's for the Syrian people to decide. And, well, and Hillary Clinton seems to have appointed herself as a spokesperson for the Syrian people. She says the Syrian people want this, the Syrian people want that. I mean, was there a meeting where they got together and decided that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama would speak for them? Exactly. This is absolutely incredible. And, you know, earlier on when you mentioned that uh, John McCain and Hillary Clinton and these people are talking about sort of, you know, uh, using force against Syria, although 
There are reports, confirmed reports, that American special ops are operating inside Syria. They're smuggling weapons over there. The Israelis are involved over there. I would like to suggest to people like John McCain and Hillary Clinton, why don't you send your own children over there? I mean, what, well, let's, let's make a petition and say, well, well, we want to draft Chelsea Clinton to go and serve in Syria. Let's see what happens then. Well, okay. there are people that uh, rhetorically say, oh, I wish I could go over there and, and do something about that government. I wish I could help. And, of course, it won't be Hillary Clinton's children or, or Barack Obama's children that go over there. But in terms of this idea that we need to do something, you have calls for NATO military intervention, open direct calls. There are reports of these covert actions, as there were in Libya, and uh, we'll, you know, we'll see more about those as time goes on. It takes time to find out more about those. But in terms of open direct action. What would happen if they got their way? If the people calling for the bombing and airstrikes and no-fly zones and so on got their way, what happens to Muslims? What happens to Christians? What happens to the groups that are involved in Syria? Well, let me tell you, uh, I think the fact that um, NATO and uh, other forces have not openly gone into Syria, they are doing this uh, through covert means, is because if they were to go with full force into Syria, uh, it it would be uh, it would unleash hell on earth. I can tell you, not only a lot of Syrians would die, but that war would not be confined to Syria. It would engulf the entire Middle East, and uh, in that sense, naturally, uh, millions of Muslims uh, would pay the price for uh, those kinds of uh, attacks. But at the end of it. What I see is, if let's say Syria were attacked, at the end of that, what I see is that uh, Israel would be badly damaged. Regimes in places like Saudi Arabia and Qatar probably would be overthrown because, you know, that that war is not going to remain confined to Syria, and Syria is no pushover. It's not Libya. It's not a country with five million people. Syria has. 23 to 24 million population. It has a very good army. It has uh, a very strong air force. It has a lot of inventory of missiles. And it has very dedicated uh, fighters uh, within the ranks of the military. So I don't think that people should underestimate uh, Syria. You see, so far, the Syrian government uh, refrained from going in and attacking civilian areas where these armed rebels were hiding. But we have seen over the last couple of weeks in places like uh, Homs, uh, which was cleansed of these people, uh, Idlib in the north, and yesterday the Syrian army turned its attention to Daraa, which was the town where the uprising had begun a, a year ago, as a result of a conspiracy, and it is documented. It was hatched in Paris, at which the following people were present, in addition to some Syrian opposition figures. Um, Bandar bin Sultan, the Saudi security advisor to the king, who used to be formerly ambassador in Washington, D.C., Jeffrey Feltman, who is the U.S. point man for that region, and Dan Shapiro, who is the American ambassador to Israel. And Mossad representatives were present in that meeting as well. Now, here you have a situation, and incidentally, this information was given by Hassam Manna, who is the head of the um, Arab Human Rights uh, League, uh, who incidentally, is not a, a, a minor figure. Uh, he's been involved in, in the struggle to get the Syrian people to get their rights, but he is absolutely opposed to uh, taking up arms because he feels that if the Syrian people were to take up arms, they would, they would suffer terrible losses and they would not be able to defeat the regime that they want to remove and to have their... Um, fundamental rights restored. Hmm. So yes. Syria is a very, very complicated situation, and nobody should have any illusions if they think that they can, uh, it, it's going to be a cakewalk and they can you know, go there and, and bring about regime change. Certainly uh, it is complicated, and there are millions of lives at stake, including millions of Iraq refugees who may get the opportunity to be liberated twice by the Americans. If, uh, Absolutely. Uh, we, yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's very scary. We'll have to keep an eye on this. Um, uh, because of the, uh, the intensity of world events at this time, 
time. Uh, I'm going to have to get back to you. I wanted to speak about Iran and uh, the latest nuclear nonsense, but we, mm-hmm. we, we don't have time this week. So I'm going to have to get back to you not too long from now. We want to look at the latest accusations that have been brought forward against Iran, uh, uh, some of the, the ignorance about basic details about the nuclear program and other things like that. So we're going to have to catch you again next time. Uh, so uh, thanks very much. Uh, Syria is an ongoing issue. Um, there's a lot of misinformation. So we're glad you can clear that up. And I know you've been writing about that and, and pe- other people have been writing about that on at uh, it's Crescent Online, right? That's correct. Crescent-Online.net, yes. Absolutely, because we can get the commentary on Afghanistan, Gaza, the, the latest. I, I, you must have a thousand articles you're editing right now. You're probably not <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> no, and, uh, I can just imagine uh, what it's like there. So that, 